Hi everyone, my name is Patrick Akil, and for today's episode, we talk about education in software. The software industry is very unique in that you can actually teach yourself how to code, but how do you start? And when you join an organization, what stuff do you take with you and how do you keep learning? I invited YouTuber, teacher, and now even CTO Hitesh Chaudhary on to talk about this topic. I'll put the links to his socials in the description below. And with that being said, enjoy the episode. Beyond coding. Yeah, my passion is actually a bit into the coding. So I have a multiple passions around. It's not just about coding or videos. It's all a mix of things. Surely coding is what I do yeah. for day-to-day -day life. And that is what I love. Absolutely. That challenging part. But apart from that, I have a huge interest in, in videos parts, how videos can be in the cinematic quality. How can I improve the audio? How can I make the best polished videos as possible? So I thought that let's mix up education with these cinematic quality of videos so that not only just like guys like Peter McKinnon or Casey Neistat, they, they are pro in making videos. But yeah. what if an educator comes with a pro quality of audio and video? What, what's going to be that outcome? So I keep on experimenting with my videos, audio gear. So that is what my passion lies around with the coding and with the videos. And YouTube is a platform that gives me to do freedom of all of that. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting that you say that, especially the name Casey Neistat. I used to be addicted to those types of videos, not just because they're entertaining, but also the video quality, the edits, the transitions, everything around it was just really cool to view and to learn from as well. Um, so I, yeah, I, I totally feel you on that one. But you mentioned education specifically. Why, why is it education for you? Education for me is something which upgrades you. That's the simple definition for me. Anything can be an education. It doesn't need to be a formal degree or a formal certification. It's just anything, anything in the life that upgrades you from what you were yesterday and what you are now or what you will be tomorrow. That's education for me. It can be by coding. It can be by learning about the camera gears. It can be about anything at all. So for me, education is a really broad topic to discuss. So if I'm teaching on a coding platform, let's just say how to build uh, even a tic-tac-toe app, so that is an education for me. If I'm teaching somebody how to make better audio or better videos, that's all education for me. Yeah. But the, the question I was wondering is why teach? Because I think the software engineering community is very distinct. There's a lot of knowledge out there and a lot of people contribute, but even more just consume, right? They, they want to learn everything they need to do to do their daily skills. There's a very distinct few that actually take what they have and teach others and you're absolutely one of them. So why why the teaching part? See, teaching is something which is internally built into me because I have faced so much of my time in solving a problem and it gets me a feeling that who should I tell this that I've <laughs> solved this problem? So I, I should share this that somebody who's facing the exact same bug, exact same problem, he should not face that uh, from now onwards because I have figured it out. Yeah. And one of the way of putting it out on the web is that, hey, I've solved this bug or I have built this app and this is the problem I faced and this is what you are going to do so that you don't face this. So that is what of teaching makes me exciting. And one of the other fundamental of teaching is if you want to upgrade your society, your country, or your community, uh, the only way to upgrade that is not via money, it's via education. Once people are more educated about certain things, it not only makes them job ready or self-sustained, it, it upgrades the entire community. So I'm one of those lucky guys who actually can do it. So why not to do it? Yeah. Yeah. I love that answer. It's it's very simple, right? Because if you've solved the problem, first of all, you want to tell people that you've solved it and yeah. teaching them how to do it themselves. I, it's just, there's a certain satisfaction in that, that they can be like, oh, you see all light bulbs going off in their heads and they actually understand what you've done, which is an awesome thing. Right? We do it on kind of a, or I do it on kind of a micro level, right? Within my team, we pair program, uh, we do knowledge sharing sessions, but what you're doing is, is on a more global scale, which is insane. I mean, I've seen the video series. I followed a few of them even, uh, for example, the most recent one on, on Go, because I'm kind of fan of Go. Uh, and I like the way you kind of make them bite-sized, right? Make them very digestible for people to consume and to learn from, because that is still the main goal there. 
Yeah, this reminds me of the thing. Like, I wanted to bring this Go series to be out there. This was not intention to be like, I'll get a million views on those series or something. Yeah. But I wanted to be the first guy who actually made this Go programming easier to understand for everybody. Nobody paid me for that. No, yeah. I put a huge amount of effort into that. And I wanted to that Go to be more popular so that anybody who is trying to learn Go should understand every lit details about it. So I went to dive into the documentation, prepared a lot of examples around it. And then when I presented it, and then when I meet people, they say, hey, I watched your that series. It feels so great that, yes, I was able to make a small impact in somebody's life, which really means a lot to me. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. So, man, it must be, I've seen some of your videos. You started like X amount of years ago, probably five plus years ago. Did you start with YouTube or were you like a software engineer before that? No, I didn't start it like five years. It's been around almost 10 years that oh, I've damn. been making videos. That's even more, yeah. <laughs> I used to be one of the top selling instructor at Udemy on iOS yeah. and on pen testing as well. In the very early days of Udemy, when we used to link uh, YouTube unlisted videos on Udemy, <laughs> it was that early. <laughs> nice. So I, I used to do that. And before that, I have taught in a couple of uh, American universities as well on how to code on C and C++ programming. Awesome. And I ha- I was into pen testing in the initial days of my journey. I used to do penetration testing and uh, web vulnerability testing for a couple of systems. And that got my interest that why people are writing bad quality of the code or, or vulnerable code. And then I moved into the software, like, let me build it myself. And then yeah. I realized, no, it's, it's not that easy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it starts simple, right? Yeah. Yeah, I get that. But so you've been doing this for kind of 10 years, and there's a lot of different facets, first of all, in those 10 years that you've covered. And I think things are escalating speed wise, right? We have the cloud now, security's on the next level. Yeah, front and back and different technologies popping out of the woodworks, popping out of the ground almost every single day, it feels like. Plus, for you to educate yourself, there's a numerous amounts of content, right? We have blog posts, YouTube videos, podcasts, wherever you want it, you can find content to consume. How do you, first of all, stay up to date? And how do you find real good quality content even in the sea of content that's out there? See, one of the problem of the YouTube and the entire internet is there's too much of the noise. So you need to learn and figure out how to remove that noise as much as possible. You cannot remove it entirely, but try to remove it as much as possible. Yeah. Now, I try to consume variety of my knowledge directly from the resources. I'm subscribed to probably so many of the newsletters out there. So whenever, uh, let's just say, MongoDB has announced an update or maybe React team is probably doing some update. So it, initially it was li- really tough, but now I'm actually under the privileged position that companies reach out to me that, hey, we are planning this out, so we want to get you into the loop. Uh, React team and MongoDB and Redis team and all those databases and all the new product, they come out to me, they actually let me know because I can make their voice a bit louder on the internet. Yeah. And that's what they try to do. So now getting updated is not that much of difficult. I'm in touch directly with the AWS team, Redis team, MongoDB. All these are like kind of a good friends now. Yeah. And I'm helping helping them that whatever the product or the updates you are rolling out, let me make a video about that. Let me make my community aware of that. So now I'm kind of a central point of consuming those all the updates that are happening in the in the coding community yeah and it's it's straight from the source right you're kind of advocating their uh the information that they're either going to bring out or as soon as it is out that it is there which is really cool yeah, and one of the great thing about them is uh, they also support this quite a lot, though. So whenever I need a resource access or something, yeah. all these companies, like one of the thing, best thing I've seen in, in the coding community is everybody is so helping in nature. If I'm not able to understand certain topics, whatever the next release they have rolled out, they get an engineer free out of his busy time and get sit with me that, hey, you explain this, Hitesh, what is the new thing we are rolling out? I understand them. I back and forth ask a lot of questions yeah. with them sitting like a sitting like a dummy and once i fully understand them then i try to kind of strip off the complexity out of it and make bit-sized tutorials so that anybody can follow it and that actually what i love about the community thing that's so good yeah that's a that's a skill right removing some of the abstraction some of the complexity there and making it teachable right even as i'm a a software engineer on the day-to-day and a lot of times you do need to explain what's happening on a technical level to your stakeholders or to your PO and doing that 
is it's difficult. You need to speak a certain language that we can understand each other, right? Because we we have different sets of skills, yet we do need each other within a team and within an organization. Yeah, that is one of the toughest things. And especially when you make tutorials, one of the toughest things, let's just say we have built a very simple e-commerce app. Yeah. Uh, you make a few orders, uh, you create some categories, list some products, and orders are shipping in, and you are just paying. That's a very basic e-commerce app. Now, building that e-commerce app is not challenging at all because eventually you'll figure out bits and pieces and you'll plug it in. The most challenging part is now you have to record that entire process. You cannot record your hours where you spend just scare, just staring at the <laughs> screen to resolve those bugs. You, you cannot do that. And let's just say sometimes you go into a tangent where you have made a mistake, you want to come back and start onto a different tangent. That is a difficult process. And the most challenging thing is still to this date is, let's just say we have built a product. Now, how we want to record that entire journey, that how to build a product, that is where the challenge comes in. You have to strip off. First, you have to design what models are going to come in, yep. what controllers you have to write. Then you have to figure out and explain the people that this is why I'm doing it. This is going to be the future impact of this. Uh, that's almost like you are designing a product three times. Exactly. It's, it's almost that that time consuming. Yeah, so you, you actually, I would have thought Thinking about it now, maybe it doesn't make sense, but I would have thought you build it as you go. But exactly as you explain, in the even the first few videos, you're like, oh, this is going to make sense in the future. And I'm like, okay, maybe, maybe he has that kind of foresight, but actually maybe you've built it already and we're walking through kind of the, the more refined version. Yeah, and again, the problem with the coding is even though you have written it, you are again building it, you are going to face new bugs into that. <laughs> so, so, yeah. And you are sometimes just staring at the screen. Ah, I didn't thought of that. That's a new bug. And then when that's when you explain people that, yeah, these kinds of things happen. So let's just figure out how we are going to fix it. Yeah, these things happen. Yeah, yeah I get that. But I mean, the benefit of teaching others, either being a trainer or being a teacher, is you go deep into the content, right? You can't really... Uh, not know your your stuff because if there's a question either in the comments or in a class someone asks you a question you want to be able to still educate them help them with that question that they have and if you don't know even uh, the basics or the fundamentals on a more deeper level you're not going to understand the question and you're not going to be able to help them so i think really drilling down into the content and making sure uh, you know your stuff basically to be able to teach to be able to train other people that's a that's a next level kind of skill, I think. Yeah, I enjoy that too much. And when, when I joined this company recently as a CTO, the entire team was happy. A lot of people were my students up here. They already got a job because of my courses. Yeah. And they got super happy that I'll be able to work with somebody who I have learned remotely. And now I'll be able to sit him just on the next, next desk and he'll be able to help me in that. So that gives a lot of things. One other thing also on top of that is, when you teach something, I always start that, hey, listen, I'm not the guy who is absolute pro. I don't know everything. Yeah. And there is no chance I'm going to ever know everything. So let's just clear this fact up here that I'm also reading a lot of documentation, a lot of books, and then I'm trying to condense that information and pass it on to you. So there are going to be chances. You are going to ask me certain questions that I'm absolutely having no idea. Yeah. So instead of just blabbering about it, I would love to point you towards the documentation and together we can move into that journey of documentation reading and can figure out the solution. Yeah, I, I really like that mindset, right? Because it's every, every information, I mean, every documentation can be read by any developer, right? We're reading the same documentation. Maybe you're better because you've been doing it longer in condensing that information and, and translating that to other people. But the documentation is there, right? The source is still there for people to read and, and educate themselves. That doesn't really change. Uh, and even if you don't know the answer, I love that you're saying, let's just partner up and try and figure this thing out because it is complex, right? What we're doing is not easy to do it the right way. I mean, it might be easy to just uh, make a solution, but to make it scalable and really understand kind of the fundamentals there, that is inherently complex. Yeah, I, I would certainly agree on that. Eventually, after doing s this exact same thing for so long, like I've been into the the very first day when the Swift programming came into that. So I've been into touch of these programming language for so long. But when you put something on the YouTube and you become a face of YouTube, it is very easy for people to just... Uh, speculate things about you and yeah. they just assume that you know everything and you are kind of a pro in programming, which is not true. We are just figuring out things on the go. Yeah. I'm just a tiny bit better in that because I've been doing this for long. <laughs> Once you will be also there doing this for 10 years, you will be also be probably better than me. 
Yeah, yeah, I like that, right? Anyone can start. It's just there's a lot of things in our mind that are like, oh, I'm either not good enough or I'm never going to get there or the kind of journey ahead is is so huge that they forget to start, right? By starting small, taking smaller steps, you will get better. You will because you put in the time and effort to do so. So eventually the time may vary, but you will get better at whatever you want to accomplish. Yeah, and one of the good thing about the new coming generation, that is, uh, I'm so old using the word generation. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the good thing about the new freshers that are coming in, now you have plethora of resources just flying around on YouTube on very, very affordable courses on Udemy. We all buy you know, like tens and thousands of courses, Udemy. Yes, all of us are guilty as charged of not finishing them, but probably we don't need to. Some of these courses we just bought to buy, uh, watch three or four videos and getting a sense of who he is and what he's teaching. So yes, I think that should be made as very normal that yes, we buy a lot of courses, but we don't finish them because we don't need to. And we're consuming a lot of information on YouTube and stuff so uh, i would recommend all of you don't feel guilty about it we all do it yeah yeah but back to kind of the sea of information that's out there i love that companies are going to you with the source of information right to educate other people but if you're new and kind of starting out and you either want to learn a programming language and do certain framework or even cloud technology or, or go more in depth in testing and security there's a lot of information right blog posts everything we just laid out what what would you advise to someone that wants to really educate themselves and in where the quality is? Is it more of the paid courses? I mean, you already mentioned newsletters. What would you advise there? I would certainly advise start with YouTube because I also provide a lot of paid courses, but I would never recommend anybody to jump directly into my paid courses. Yeah. If you're trying to learn anything new, uh, right now the media is all about videos and podcasts. So try to follow up some of your favorite persons on YouTube or podcasts or wherever they exist on Twitter or somewhere. And don't just hurry up into absorbing that knowledge. You are going to spend entire week in figuring it out who are the top persons in the YouTube space or Udemy space or whatever the space you are talking about? And then try to figure out your line. And one of the things which people actually are scared of is approaching those instructors. Yes, mm. they might be having big numbers on YouTube and stuff, but just give them a hi or hello. I'm pretty sure they are in the community. They are going to reply you up on that. So don't be scared of that. Once you, are, once you have figured out that these are the five top people in my segment, whether you are learning Spring Boot, AWS, Cloud, Ethereum, Blockchain, whatever that is, there are only a handful of instructors who are going to provide you the actual value. One of the good things about this entire uh, coding community is they can smell the bullshit <laughs> quite from far. So they yeah, can right. understand that this person is, doesn't actually know the tag or he's just... Uh, on the surface itself. Once you have figured out those proper instructors and you are getting a sync with them that, yes, I'm able to resonate with this person on the same frequency, then you, sh you can actually go ahead and try to take their courses or their recommended books or just discuss them that this is where I want to go. Can you recommend me some books or some courses or do you have some material on your side? So just go ahead and try that out. I think that's a fantastic start that you can make. Yeah, yeah, I really like that. That's, that's what I do personally. I, I go to YouTube. I don't really like to read that much. So blog posts and stuff like that, it's not really for me. Uh, but the video content, as well as someone just explaining it, it makes a lot of sense. That's kind of for me, how I learn uh, that plus podcasts, just because I can do other stuff while still listening and learning. I used to game a lot, which also meant okay, was, at some point uh, you're done gaming, you want something to still kind of uh, stimulate you. So I would listen to a lot of podcasts while still gaming. That would, that would be kind of my I, multitask. I, I also watch a lot of podcasts, not watch, but listen to a lot of podcasts. I, I enjoy that because podcasts, I don't have to ask any question. It's just, just put up your headphones and that's it. Somebody is doing a conversation for you entirely and you can just enjoy that very meaningful and very guided conversation with a good audio, of course. So I just absolutely <laughs> love podcasts. Yeah, same here. I kind of lost my train of thought there. Um, when someone's just starting out, right, we already said the information is really overwhelming. But what I think is, is more important is you need a certain mindset, right? You need to keep going no matter how, how huge that hill is in front of you. You need to be able to digest, be able to put to practice and, and kind of teach yourself a lot of things, right? You can, sure, you can follow a course, you can go to a university, uh, get a more formal education. But with software engineering, it's, it's very unique that you can actually teach yourself a lot of stuff because that is already out there. 
Yeah, one other thing which I absolutely recommend to a lot of students is that, hey, uh, don't just go aimlessly that I have to keep on going, I have to keep on going because this might saturate you uh, after some time. Mm. What you should do is set up a goal that what do you really want to build because it's all about engineering and engineering is known for building the stuff, whether it's an application or a website or uh, maybe you want to produce something new, whatever that is, just set up a goal. What do you want to learn and why do you want to learn it? What, what's the goal that you want? to achieve. Once you finalize that goal that I want to build um, my own Spotify or I want to build my own Amazon or something, just set up that as a benchmark that whatever I'm going to learn, I'm going to learn to accomplish that goal. I want to build that thing. Once you have that goal set, you won't be caring what comes in between, what technology you have to learn, whether that's a <laughs> cloud or something new. Just focus on that thing. And that has actually helped uh, like millions of students that, yeah, I have built up, I have set up a goal and I've built that, I have accomplished that. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense that you lay it out like that because that's how you learn on the job, right? You don't set your own goal, maybe. Maybe you have a company goal or a team goal. Something needs to happen. And if you don't know, you'll make sure you get all the resources that you can find and try and make it happen, right? Try and reach that goal. The difference here is you need to set your own goal and still try and get that instead of being in a more organizational sense in that way. Yeah, very yeah, good. And particip participate in a lot of hackathons or the community meets or anything that happens because it's not, programming is not about just, yeah, surely movies and all these tell us that, hey, we just sit in the dark room, <laughs> write the codes and stuff. Uh, that is one perspective. But in reality, that is not. Programmers are very friendly. They're very approachable. Surely they don't talk to the outside world. That's why they say that programmers don't like to talk to the world because we don't like to honestly talk to the outside world. But once you get a sync with the uh, programmer itself, uh, then it's all nice and happy. Yeah. So what I was wondering is, you already alluded to it earlier, that a lot of the technical problems we can actually solve, right, in a technical team or even individually as software engineers. Technical problems are easier. What's harder is solving, first of all, the right problems and doing it in a more organizational setting, in a more traditional sense in a way. Because I do see a lot of organizations struggling with deliveries, deadlines get moved up, requirements are not stable. Why do you think that is, that it is more of a struggle in a more organizational sense? So I would say that there are two specific challenges here that we can address. The first one is when the fresher actually comes into an organization, he's following a lot of YouTubers and I'm one of them and others are there. And our job is to present the cutting edge technology in front of everyone. And that's why the freshers thinks that, yeah, only best solution is the best and the most latest one, which mm. is not true in certain cases. Everybody loves microservices, but sometimes maybe your architecture is more of a monolith architecture, and that's where your uh, strength is going to come in. So don't always go for the latest and the cutting edge. Try to think a little bit on to the uh, more of a robust solution. And the second problem that I have personally faced and seen is when your product manager or your senior uh, CXOs doesn't come from the tech background. Mm. Because in order to understand what tech persons are saying, you need to be a tech person because their language, their words are completely different. So somebody might be absolutely good in his uh, management courses, but managing programmers is a different game altogether. Yeah. You cannot be just an MBA or a, 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 a manager and can manage all the programmers. So if a person has written a great amount of code in his life and you push him towards the managerial position, first of all, that's a challenging in itself. Yeah. But if he moves on to that top hierarchy, he will be able to understand what my uh, fellow programmers are saying, if the deadlines are extending, why they are extending. And if the client requirement are not frozen up, what impact is going to make. So it's very important that we push to these managerial positions, the programmers who have existingly written some code, we need to push them up forward. And that's the only way to make a better organization. Yeah, but that, that brings along a lot of other challenges as well, right? Because if you're in a manager position, all of a sudden, first of all, you're going to be less on the keyboard, less hands-on. Uh, one of your main strengths should then be communication, educating, and kind of cultivating talent within your team. And those skills, we don't learn as software engineers. Sure, we can teach ourselves or we can learn by looking at what other managers do. But those are very distinct skills that, that, that me, I'm looking for those in my manager, right? And I love when they can talk with me tech as well. Um, but those other skills, they, they don't come by default. Yeah. 
that that is why these organizations are facing these challenges that they are not able to communicate better because it is so hard to make a programmer leave his keyboard and make more managerial decision it is very difficult yeah. and finding that person is difficult and that is why the challenge comes in as, as i was mentioning to you earlier as well that when i joined in as a cto into this company everybody was happy and thrilled that now we have a person in the senior position who understand us who knows how to write the code and who understand that if something is getting delayed why it is delayed he can throw all the jargons at me and i'll be saying that yes these are all good excuses you can say but yes this is all something and i accept totally that this is not going to be into production in the next week so we need to hold it off so that is where you need to find people who actually understand the tech and speaks the tech language yeah yeah it comes from both sides i used to say a lot right it's from a developer side of things they need to be able to to change their language based on the people that they're talking to but also from the other side it helps if you understand technology right if you are a stakeholder you know why things get delayed or you have an understanding of how things operate but from a developer sense we can change our language right we can dive into marketing can you i don't me? think so i right? don't think so that developers are going to change their language anytime soon i i don't think so that's happening but i i do think like even even ddd for example defining a domain uh defining your language within those domains and making sure you can understand each other and communicate right that is part of that that is part of creating that shared language so we can actually communicate and i do think developers need to understand their domain right need to understand where their piece of the tech comes in so they do need to understand for example if you're in an e-commerce it helps to know what a warehouse management system is what happens in there logistically what happens on a more financial level right how do we bill for example our suppliers or how do we actually make money right those are not necessarily technical facets they do help you understand the business and also help speak that language but from a business side they don't really care what happens under the hood on a technical level so then that dialogue becomes harder yeah that's why i recommend a lot of people try to do a startup like even if it is a small scale when you do a startup you manage everything on your own from the business side to how to pay the salaries to how to scale the infrastructure to the tech just try to do one uh, stand alone startup and you will understand everything and you will be able to speak every language that possibly exists in business yeah i i do think it would help if even from an organizational point of view we spend a lot more attention on on kind of getting that communication right right making sure that the non-technical people know a little bit of tech making sure that the technical people know a little bit more about their domain and we're always going to work in teams right you don't need to be an expert in everything it might be when you you're actually in a startup that's kind of a different diamond i guess uh, but it does help if you know kind of the nuances if you know the surface if you know the general knowledge that is required there yeah that certainly helps because and again i do totally agree on that that's not easy thing that's one of the biggest challenge right now all organization is running through that hey can you find us a good manager who can talk to our team or our team is not able to deliver the products on time yeah the team is not able to deliver the product on time because probably you haven't frozen the requirements mm. or you were not able to communicate those requirement in a in a fashion that they need so you need a guy who is intermediate between them yeah. uh, i would say you need a compiler <laughs> exactly yeah, i i like that <laughs> yeah. on your on your first point when you mentioned that right new people or even existing uh, or more senior engineers like trying out new technologies right but there's a certain a certain robustness that you need before you put it into production right let's say we have an app on my phone and it's buggy i'm either going to go to a competitor or i'm not going to use this app anymore because it doesn't work right from a user perspective if it doesn't work you're done people have very short attention spans nowadays so the technologies that we use must have certain standards must be more robust than the more new and up and coming things but those we love to learn about we love to play around with and even sometimes we love to put it into production as well so uh this reminds me of one of the stories so before joining up here i was working as a kind of consultant i was writing some code as well for this startup and i recommended them that hey you are a startup who is focusing a lot on india and in the market is more oriented towards android mm -hmm. surely ios is there we cannot lose that but given the fact that how much budget you have i think you should focus more on android and i would highly recommend that i already have experience in the react native domain so you should start with react native or just go 
go purely on Android, maybe with Kotlin or maybe with Java, that would give you more advantage and you will face eventually less of the bottleneck when things actually go onto the scale. Mm -hmm. But a lot of new uh, engineers were there and they all were a big fan of Flutter and they wanted to go all in with the Flutter <laughs> yeah. because development and building up the UIs and everything was so great in that. Mm -hmm. So eventually they decided that, no, Itish, uh, we're going to go with the Flutter itself. I said, that's cool as well. Let's go with that if you are insisting on that. Yeah. Now, we did spend 1.5 a month into the development of building the UIs and everything. And when it comes to injecting those APIs, that's where we we saw some of the bottleneck into the Flutter. We found out that there are certain packages which are not ready in the Flutter, especially one of them was uh, we wanted to convert some of the JSON data into SQL and Excel and all of that. Yeah. We faced so many of the issues that we... Yeah. We came into a situation that either we need to build a package and publish it yeah. or there, there's no way going forward. So, see, this kind of a thing comes up in a lot in organization that sometimes you're so much focused on the new tech that is coming out that you forgot to evaluate that what are our requirements? Is this framework or is this library or is this tech is going to fulfill my requirement or not? And you need to consult somebody senior who has been doing this stuff. So that's where the challenge comes into the organizations. Yeah. Yeah, the hard thing about software engineering is, especially when you put it into practice, there's going to be unforeseen events, right? Already, if you're building a smaller project on your own, you're going to find bugs, you're going to find unforeseen things. Take that and and put it on a huge scale of an organization, right? With thousands of users, or in, at least uh, the aim is to, to get to a lot of users. You're going to face a lot of issues. And those can be blocking with regards to progression, right? As you mentioned with the Flutter example, Either you need to put in the technical resources to make that package to actually make sure you meet your requirements or you're kind of screwed, right? You need to pivot as soon as possible. Yeah, so we are at a situation, we were at a situation now that we cannot pivot back because we have spent 1.5 months in building the UIs in Flutter. Yeah. And now just because one package is there and that package was consuming probably 15, 20 days more. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> we are at a position we cannot go back, we cannot move forward. Uh, we are stuck there. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And and stuck oh, oh. is not a place you want to be. <laughs> yeah, and the only way for, for us at that point was to move forward. And we didn't know that if the same situation is going to arrive again or not. Yeah, yeah. And man, that must be kind of daunting, right? Because you're you're going on a road. First of all, you're trailblazing because if you're using a new technology, hasn't been established, not a lot of content out there yet. People are still figuring things out. Is this even robust enough to give to a user and, and to make use of it in production, right? So that must yeah. be very scary as well then. Yeah, so another example that I have is I also have one of the company, Learnist, which handles 12 million users. So that is already at a scale. And yep. uh, at that time, we, like still to this date, we are on Ruby on Rails because we find it much more solid, much more opinionated. We want something which is opinionated, which stops us from doing the wrong things. Yep. Uh, and at that time, LinkedIn was doing so much of marketing that we have moved into Node.js. Yeah. So I've been teaching Node.js for, for a while, but for a product of that scale and the requirements, very specific requirement that we have there, uh, we moved certain of our microservices into Node.js and immediately we saw, no, this is not the way we need to go. <laughs> It was performing well, but a lot of new engineers were coming in and they were using Express in certain way that we don't want it because these are not good practices. And teaching every one of them that this is not good practice, use this. This is not good practice, use this. It was very challenging for us. In Ruby on Rails, we didn't need to tell anybody because there is only one way of doing the things in Ruby on Rails. Exactly. Yeah, it's it's a hard thing, right? And it's it's harder even to to communicate, for example, to your business that this is an issue, right? Yes, we can use Node.js. Yes, we will have certain benefits, certain downsides. But a huge downside is it's not that opinionated, right? Which means we need conventions. If we don't have those conventions, everyone's going to do everything. You're going to give them a paint, a paint bucket. One person's going to paint blue. One person's going to paint red. It's going to be a mess of different colors. Well, if you're, first of all, a language is opinionated, it has certain colors, right? It has colors that harmonize, 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 if I'm sticking with the same example. Or you can make those conventions. You can be like, oh, only use red, blue, and green. But you need to actually educate people then, especially new ones. Yeah, exactly. I, I teach this in my classes as well, that you might be a big fan of variables, but I'm a big fan of constants. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. But 
the challenge there is when you learn, it's more in isolation, right? Especially if you're just starting out, you're going to consume a lot of content. I don't think you're going to co-create with other people, right? You're first of all going to teach yourself how to do it. It's going to be in a certain way, probably, because you're going to be like, ah, this is how I do it. This is how I know it. This might be one of the ways, but I think it's the best way because that's how I know how to do it. You're going to put that into practice. When you come into a team setting, they're going to teach you. These are the rules. You can also do it like this. These are the trade-offs. Why did you choose one of these options? Why did you execute it like this? And that's when your learning kind of kicks in overdrive, right? Then you're going to have different opinions, different discussions, and they're all going to contribute to kind of your, your learning journey in that way as well. So that's why I always say that surely start your journey alone, but don't travel the entire path alone yeah. uh, because the community is so vibrant in that you can join conferences, you can join hackathons, you can join internships. A lot of companies even provide free tools or uh, there are a lot of cohorts that are going in. So even though there are a lot of them are free as well, <laughs> most of the hackathons are entirely free. Just walk into them have a discussion with other programmers and see what others are building the same thing in what manner. One of the challenges with the programmers is when you build things alone, you don't think too much about the scalability of the product. So that's where, and some of the programmers even I've seen, they work in the big companies like Amazon and Microsoft. They're great companies, great products. But when you join in as an engineer, you're building just a screw of certain things and you don't know where that screw is will be injected because the machinery is so big now. Yeah. So it take initial few days and experience with building either your own startup or join some startup and do everything on your own. That that will make a lot of changes in you. Yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm really fan and more and more fan of kind of those co-creation patterns. Mob programming and, and pair programming is what I do the most. I haven't had that much experience with mob programming. But first of all, I learn how people think, how they implement, and we have a dialogue. I can ask questions immediately and they can answer or vice versa. And I learn stuff about their tool set, right? Because you're probably going to use GitHub. You're going to use some kind of version management system. They're going to have nuances. The way they use their editors, the hotkeys that they use is going to make them more effective. And immediately you learn about those, right? I can ask questions. I can be like, is this on purpose or do you want it like this? Did you know this even existed? And you're never going to get that if you program in isolation. I really think doing that together, co-creating in that way, has a lot of residual benefits that is going to make you more effective. But a lot of people and even a lot of organizations say, do developers working on the same problem? That doesn't sound effective. No, no, I think that's a totally wrong notion. It is very effective when two or three great minds work on the same problem because you're going to uh, get the best outcome that's possibly coming out of the three best minds you have hired in your organization. Yeah. So I totally believe in that. And also on top of that, a lot of my videos that I post on Instagram deals and stuff, they are all about tricks. So all the tricks that I share there, they are not like I have found them. They came out in the discussion with other programmers and I'm like, hey, does anybody know this or should I make a video about that? So most of my videos are all about discussions that we had around in the conference room or something. And I, yeah. I try to make a video out of them. Yeah, exactly. You want to be as effective as possible, right? And a trick might sound bad initially, but if you have just a huge toolbox and you can pick and choose and, and use the tools when they need to happen, or when you have a certain problem, you can pick the best tools in that way as well. You can be effective in what you're doing. You're going to be more efficient, right? Sure might take longer to solve the actual problem. But if you're efficient in everything around that, right, even doing branching, rebasing, little tools that you need as a developer, uh, it's going to make you more effective down the road. Yeah, again, I told you that the whole root of these things are because management, the top management in some of the big organizations, they are not coming from the coding background. So they look everything as where can we get the most optimized uh, usage of the resource. And when somebody as an engineer or somebody as a coder who reaches out at the top management, that's where you understand that what could be the better. Engineers are built different. They are not regular people. The coders, they are not regular people at all. They're built different they have a different language itself and their community is different so yeah management need to understand this that we are built different yeah yeah developers are very scarce right and you can do two things i think from an organizational point of view you can take your best engineer make them a manager uh, but they might be unhappy right you need to give people the option 
Do you want the manage, managerial track? Right. This is what it entails. You're going to focus more on communication. You're going to let go more of the hands-on work, but you're going to be a multiplier, right? You being in that position is going to make other people more effective, is going to make our organization more effective. It's no longer one plus one. You're multiplying everyone. Or you want to give them the option. You keep doing what you're doing. You go deeper, right? You specialize. You really become the best at the hands-on work and be a great mind in that way. And sure, you have huge mind. It's a, a huge huge. And just stumbled over my words there. You have huge amounts of facets there as well, right? You have cloud, security, testing, architecture, and actually software engineering with different amounts of languages. It's a huge playing field. But I think from an organizational point of view, you want to give people the option. The option should be there for your existing engineers or for new engineers that you bring in. Yeah, exactly. Like what we did recently here as well, there is one great programmer uh, buddy here uh, in the organization and we wanted to push him towards the team lead position as a team manager, mm -hmm. uh, but he was not willing to go there. He said, no, sir, I want to write more code. I'll, I'll do that better. You can hire us a manager. And then I sat with him and explained that, see, I can bring another guy from a managerial background, but he won't be able to understand you that much. And the team way the team understands you is way, way better. So what we agreed on that, that in every week, I'll give him two dedicated days where he'll be purely writing code, no managerial uh, work at all. Yeah. And rest of the days, he's going to manage the thing. So this is kind of agreement we came in. So I was more than happy to promote an existing engineer into the managerial position. And that's what I'm doing here. Yeah. And I think every engineer, every engineer that I've met wants to be effective, right? They want to be as effective in writing code or they want to be as effective in solving those problems. And just, you need to find out what your personal balance is on that. Is it more hands-on? Is it more high over? It's going to be a learning journey. You can go high over and then be like, this is not for me and go back. That's no problem at all. Just experience. I think that's the only way. Exactly. And I have never met any engineer who wants to push bad code and not exactly. even one, uh, not even one. But again, if you're going to push so much of pressure of the deadline and releasing the product, he's going to do some hacks and he's going to just make that get push. <laughs> but uh, he doesn't want to do it willingly. So you need to understand that sometime if engineer is saying, hey, this is not good, we need to hold this release. Listen to him. Yeah. He's saying it for everybody's greater good. Yeah. Yeah, and then we get into the same issues. If the people that are involved in, in creating those technical solutions are non-technical, I'm mainly talking about POs here, and they help in or they discuss the technical solutions, they'll go for the fastest one because that means delivery, that means we're going to make the deadlines. But that has a very short-term mindset, right? And software is such a long-term game, right? Those trade-offs that you're going to make now are going to have huge impact or might have huge impact in the future, the problem is might have, which is, they, that makes it harder to communicate. To have. Yeah. We, we, can, we can remove this might word from there because they <laughs> certainly are going to put the bad impact and probably you need to your entire code base from the scratch because of those uh, shortcuts that you have taken. So don't take them. Yeah, but it, I see that often, like way more often. I feel like as engineers, we should really push back on those or not even give those as options, right? Because they shouldn't be options. If they will have impact in the future, Negative impact, there shouldn't be an option. Don't discuss with your stakeholders, uh, should we write tests? Absolutely. It's part of your craft. It's part of what you should do. That's not even a question, right? That's in your definition of done. Absolutely. 100% agree on that. Yeah. yeah. I We went kind of all over the place with the main line of education. I, I really enjoyed this conversation. Is there anything that's still missing that you still wanted to share? Uh, I guess that's more about I can geek out all day about coding <laughs> practices and what's new coming in, how Kotlin is doing, how Flutter is doing, uh, what iOS version next is pushing us. So I, I think we we all are on the geeky side, so we can push out a lot. Uh, but again, one thing I can put in is, hey, uh, check out my channel as well. Uh, probably that's... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Hitesh, I'm going to put all his socials in the description below. Check him out and let him know you came from our podcast as well. Uh, the next show we might do is in person. If uh, Hitesh is ever in Holland, we'll actually do this face to face. And uh, absolutely, that that's kind of a one uh, deal I can make with you. Shortly, <laughs> one podcast in person. That's going to happen for sure. Awesome! I'll, I'm going to look forward to that one then. Thanks for listening, everyone, and we'll see you on the next one. Thanks for listening, everyone. If you like the episode and want to support the show, don't forget to leave a rating. Better yet, share the episode with a friend. 
Let us know in the comment section below what you want to hear and we'll make it happen. Cheers.